Hare Krishna, Krishna Vishak Prabhu, welcome back to the Monks Podcast. It's auspicious day of our Bhaktivinoda Thakur today, so I thought that we could discuss something about him and especially about how he has positioned himself in a way that his outreach becomes effective. Hmm. Mm. So we could discuss about his, uh, how he positioned himself politically with respect to the ruling government at that time, intellectually with respect to the ethos and culturally with respect to the existing culture and religious establishment. And especially what we can learn, what we have done as a movement and what we can do individually while positioning ourselves also, we can draw some lessons from that. Is that okay? Hmm. Yeah, that's totally fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. Th- thank you for having me on your podcast. Um, I'd like to. Yeah, go ahead, please go. Sorry. Ahead. No, please complete. You're saying something. Oh, I said, I just said, I thank you for having me on your podcast. Yeah, I said, several devotees appreciated our previous discussion and especially the specific examples of Bhaktivinoda Thakur's broad mindedness were something which many had not heard of. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot we could discuss about Bhaktivinoda Thakur in the next year yeah. also. So yeah. <clears throat> I believe you also wanted to share something about some developments. Would you like to do it? This would be Thakur's place. Like to do it now? Or yeah, sure. Sure. Yes, I can, I can, I can say it now. Yeah. I can say it now. Um, so for the last 12 years, um, I have been regularly in touch with um, my friends at Birnagar in West Bengal, India which is Bhaktivinoda Thakur's birthplace. Mm. And they had invited me on several occasions to become their trustee. Um, And uh, this year I accepted it. And they passed a resolution inviting me to um, start a research center there. And that is uh, something I'm going to dedicate myself um, to for at least the next four or five years till it flourishes, at least that's my hope. Um, and I wanted to share on this special location um, the interactions between Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada Lalita Prasad Thakur, so who was they, a brother by they, of... Sorry, minute, sorry. By they, are you referring to the... Sorry? They who are the trustees of the place, are they the descendants of... Who yes. are the descendants of Lalita Prasad Thakur? Descendants, there are, they are, they are mostly followers of Lalita Prasad Thakur who has maintained that place, but there are also other places like Bhakti Bhavan and his, you know, several places um, that where where people know each other and they kind of either directly or indirectly connected with the bloodlines of Bhakti Bhavan Thakur, but also more importantly, actually, uh, the spiritual lines of Bhakti Bhavan Thakur. And there were several. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was uh, a great uh, kind of outreach acharya for Gaudiya Vaishnavism. That's true. And he uh, several uh, he started several places where he was his Namahanta centers and other things were flourishing during his time. And um, some of some of his uh, properties in Mayapur um, was inherited by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and some of his um, estates in Puri like Chuti Mangalpur went to other people and Lalita Prasad Thakur was at Birnagar, his birthplace that was a part of his family estate from his mother's side, from the Mustafi side mm. and um, in 1972, Srila Prabhupada from ISKCON went there to meet Lalita Prasad Thakur and they discussed together to have a research center. Who are they? Called Srila Prabhup- Prabhupada and Prabhupada Lalita Prasad Thakur. Okay. Saraswati Thakur's brother. And Srila Prabhupada, ISKCON's Prabhupada used to... Lalita Prasad Thakur also titled as Prabhupada? Or is it... Our Prabhupada used to call him Prabhupada. Oh, okay. So is there in the database? Okay, so Prabhupada was not a like a very rare title, is it? Like Bhakti Sanat Thakur was called. No, Prabhupada. Prabhupada. No, any no, it is not anybody uh, who is uh, the leader of 
a certain group of Vaishnavas are called Prabhupada by that group of Vaishnavas. Okay. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur was called Prabhupada by his followers and Saraswati Thakur was called Prabhupada by his followers and uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami was called Prabhupada by his followers. So anybody who is in a senior position and in the, in the, in the position of a leadership of a, uh, of a community is usually called Prabhupada by the community. It's like the title professor, right? It is, professor is a rare title, so to say, in society but it's not a rare title in universities. Similarly, within Vaishnava communities, Rupa Goswami is Prabhupada, Sanatana Goswami is Prabhupada, and you know, Gopal Bhatta Goswami is Prabhupada, Krishna so, Chakravarti Thakur is there Prabhupada. Are communities. So would Gaur Vrishadas Babaji also be called as Prabhupada, or generally Babajis are not called Prabhupada? Saraswati Thakur would call him Prabhupada, I'm sure. Okay. It's Vaishnava culture. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> okay, good. So you're talking about the research center, their discussion about that. Yes, and Srila Prabhupada, uh, when he went to Russia, wrote handwritten letters to Lalita Prasad Thakur, um, addressing him as Prabhupada and ad- addressing his Tata. Tata means Tauji, like a Jathamasha in Bangla, or a father's elder brother. So because um, Saraswati Thakur and Lalita Prasad Thakur uh, were brothers, and they were both very deep devotees, um, Prabhupada respected him a lot. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur wrote his autobiography as a 200 page letter addressed to Lalita Prasad Thakur. Mm. And um, it is the, his particular followers who has had authority over um, his estates. And um, Tamakrishna Maharaj knew about some family connections I've had with uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's family. And he was um, very interested and he had um, asked me to pursue uh, the study of Bhaktivinoda Thakur's works in his personal letters to me. And so in a way, what the news that I shared today is a culmination of almost 20 years of um, just being there and being there for them and serving Vaishnavas without any need to, you know, uh, create projects that might hurt individuals or, um, you know, so it was done in a very, um, it was done maintaining Vaishnava etiquette. And um, just as the people in Birnagar, uh, sorry, uh, Bangnapara had welcomed Bhaktivinoda Thakur as a part of their family by giving him the title of Bhaktivinoda and making him one of the leaders of their community. Uh, mm. I have been given that honor and I'm very grateful to the individuals who did it. Um, some of my family members are a part of that Lalita Prasad Thakur's line. Mm-hmm. Uh, my uh, cousin sister, Dana Manjari, uh, and my aunt, Bakula Manjari, they're all part of that um, mm-hmm. dhara, so to say, that tradition. Um, and it's, it's small, but I think to be able to have access to Bhaktivana Thakur's birthplace and the ability to help transform that as an academic research center would be something not only Bhaktivana Thakur wanted, but also other acharyas like Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada Ladin Prasad Thakur um, and their followers wanted. Somehow it didn't happen over many years, but... Um, finally, they came about and said, yes, we want to do a research center. And all the tr- trustees unanimously agreed. So that's the good news I wanted to share. Wonderful. Congratulations. <laughs> a big step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So you are able to integrate your academic expertise with your traditional devotional lineage or devotional connections. And I think this will be a significant step forward in Spreading the legacy of perpetuating and spreading the legacy of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. All the very best. Yes. Work. Yes. Um, but more importantly, the vision of Srimad Bhagavatam is very, very broad. In fact, when I uh, speak with people, they say that this is a radical book. <laughs> and Bhaktivinoda Thakur, in that sense, was a very progressive person. And, you know, we we're talking about politics of mm-hmm. Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Um, and we want to do that research center because um, the, 
my friends and I who are now associated with it deeply uh, believe that the message that Bhaktivinoda Thakur tried so desperately to get to Western shores uh, is meant to benefit the entire ecosystem of our planet. It's not about one country, not one segment of people. And um, I hope that one day that this research center becomes as important as the Frankfurt School, for example, that came up with critical theory uh, that was meant to engage scholarship for human emancipation. Right? And that was Bhaktivinoda Thakur's mood, motive, and mission as well. Mm. And in this regard, some uh, people asked me that he was friends with um, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, the author of um, the novel Anandamot and the song Vande Mataram. Okay, just a minute before doing so. Where are we going right now? Are you talking about with the politics of Bhaktivinoda Thakur? Okay, so the research center you are leading that discussion from there to the to the. Yeah, I think we discussed four points today: his politics, his intellectual contributions, his cultural um, location, and his religious disposition. Yeah. That's so, so I'm kind of addressing each point one by one. So we are talking we are right discussing now, the, the political positioning, the politics. Yes. Okay. The politics of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So let me let me, let me yeah, keep please. in mind. I'll I will um, phrase where I am coming from. Sure, if please. You could take it forward from there. So, the Indian history, as is studied in the in the academic books or in the, in the school books, also at least in mm -hmm. India. It is seen as a history of independence and right. struggle for independence. And I don't think in mm. my history books, I even read the term Bengali, Bengal Renaissance, Bengal Renaissance as it is called mm. in academic texts. This talk, that mm. We did talk about how Bengal was the seat of uh, many of the prominent leaders who pioneered Indian independence. Mm. And they rejuvenated uh, that eventually led to the Indian independence. So that is one way of looking at it. But so after that, when I started studying Bhakti Nath Thakur, uh, of course, the well-known incident is Bhakti Nath Thakur told Prabhupada that let's wait for, you know, don't, don't get involved in the independence struggle, focus on sharing Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. so, now, it seems that this is not just uh, Bhakti Nath Thakur's specific introduction to Bhakti Nath Thakur. But overall, even Bhaktivinoda Thakur did not seem to sympathize much or at least did identify with the independence struggle so much. Mm. So he was employed in the British government. Mm. And there is this famous metaphor which seems to have infuriated some of his or at least agitated some of his uh, other Indian uh, contemporaries where he said that we are like the older brother and they are like the younger brother. So mm -hmm. let the younger brother manage the estate and let the older brother focus on spiritual matters. If both of them have right. got inherited property from their, uh, from their father. So it seems that uh, overall he, he was not so much, uh, at least not passionate about bringing about change in the government. And mm -hmm. especially after the 1857 mutiny where it seemed that the British uh, crushed it quite brutally and there was mm. a certain amount of oppression. But even in his autobiography and in his writings about it, he is, is quite conspicuously silent about that. Mm. So he hardly ever speaks anything negative about the British Empire. And mm. we consider that uh, there were, uh, uh, there, I think near Britain, in Bangladesh itself, I think there was, it had a flourishing handloom industry and it seems that the British completely destroyed it. They went and cut off the thumbs of thousands and thousands of people who had been in the handloom industry. And they, so there was a certain uh, economic toll, apart from a cultural toll, which happened um, mm. and which agitated Indians quite a bit. But Bhaktivinoda mm. Thakur kept himself at a distance from it. So, mm. so did he not, cons so at least initially, 
the independence struggle was seen as also a spiritual struggle because if they felt that it is when india becomes independent then we can rejuvenate our culture we can rejuvenate our spirituality with political control of somebody else we can't do it as much as we want to so True. what was his vision at that what is your understanding of his vision in positioning himself the way he did the article that you're referring to is called um british rajya o boishna brindo it was published in the first volume first issue of the sajjana toshini magazine and in that article he says that um you know by by destiny's um arrangement uh, the british and the indians are now on same land and um the whole idea that we are elders taking your spiritual things and you are young youngsters taking your the estate is a simplistic way to put it i think there is a lot going on at that time first of all um you're right and we all know that he was a deputy magistrate and employed with the british government but more than that what happened is that particular year um a bill was passed called the ilbert bill and they were that allowed indian judges to preside in courts in and ilbert, there was I, ilb or i i l b e r t okay if i have this right um but anybody can google it up and it's you know there's ton of information online now the major point of contention at that um you know kind of era in history Mm-hmm. is that whether brown skinned people sorry to interrupt you which year are we talking about roughly at this 1885 okay the major issue at that particular moment in history was uh racism surprisingly and um the proposition that people of brown color do not have the moral fiber to be able to judge criminals of white skin so if a indian judge or a deputy magistrate gets somebody in his court who has been accused of a crime and this person happens to be white then indians don't have a right to judge them that was a problem and that article is written in the, yeah, at, the at the cusp of that political uh, upheaval in india and in that article he not only addresses that political um concern but a much wider uh issue at stake that is whether european systems of politics will actually work in india and that is where history and politics kind of emerge for bhaktivinod thakur and uh in 1869 or 17 is krishna samhita 15 years earlier um he discussed indian history from a vaishnava perspective in the upakramanika the introduction to krishna samhita okay just to interrupt and you. he does a very yes please so did bhaktinath thakur ever judge uh, the british or he was not authorized to do that he would judge only yes. i mean you know i'm pretty sure he would have british criminals in his court no so not once in a while there there weren't too many the population the british population wasn't that high but there were people who would come in as soldiers and would get involved in petty crime and would be taken to a magistrate for judgment according to british law and bakivan thakur was a magistrate now so i haven't looked into all of his judgments yeah no no, no but you said that whether indians had the moral fiber to judge british that was a question brown skin could judge yeah that was the point of that was the point of contention the british white british uh, a segment of the british white people said no and then the government said well what's the problem if they are educated why why can't we have indians be a part of running that country and so the government in then, a sense was more non non racist than the general cultural mood of the people the government went back and forth gaur see the thing is in, in a in a democratic system whatever the popular sentiment is is eventually going to find its way to power 
there was no democracy there na at that time in no, india i mean britain britain had democracy and but, india was a british colony so they, now they, they did say that indians indians are not mature enough to yeah. decide how to govern themselves but that's another question for another time that's fine we're talking about 1885 and so um J- john stuart mill who was a british historian uh wrote a british history of india or something like that where he says india is a very interesting part of british history and <laughs> it's a very interesting part of british history okay interesting and bhaktivino thakur takes that and turns it around and says well actually england is an interesting part of indian history <laughs> <laughs> okay clever <laughs> and he in in his krishna samhita he gave a breakdown of the various how you know some of it is based on the bhagavat some of it is based on oriental scholarship and he tries to find a middle ground but more than that i think what he is trying to say there in that article is his response to the german philosopher uh, hegel who came up with theories of um yeah, like the german theory of progressive vision you know Yes so it's Hegel like, had a theory of something called weltgeist yeah weltgeist is the world coast or the world spirit yeah um that you could say that you know there is some connection between that and say for example the oversoul of uh, the boston transcendentalists who were also very popular in calcutta and bhaktivinoda thakur was also reading their books but hegel had this idea that civilizations grow like human beings and then they die out and for him the ancient civilizations like egypt india uh, or china that still continue their old traditions were stuck in infancy because they continue their old traditions whereas a civilization a european civilization in particular actually made progress right and when he saw napoleon he he said i see the world spirit on a horseback <laughs> right hegel was german and napoleon was french but still he appreciated yeah but yes but this person was influencing the politics of his time so much that hegel said i see history on a horseback or i see the world geist on a horseback now If the telos this one to interrupt yes. we are, we are yeah. sort of overlapping intellectual and political isn't it right now because we can't have that yes but i'm going to talk about bhadraloks when we discuss intellectual stuff but i'm just talking about uh, the politics of the situation okay. now hegel was very clear uh, in his theories where he said no state no history so unless you have a political state uh, you cannot write history and if you did not have a political state it's called prehistorical and that's one way of saying that well these people are not civilized enough to be writing their own history Oh. and they also by the time the british people came they were also studying all of the puranas and making fun of them <laughs> because they came with the lenses of biblical miracles right walking on water and talking about miracles we have too many biblical miracles are nothing compared to <laughs> the descriptions of various kinds agatsya muni drinking up a whole like ocean or a river of water yeah. and then getting it out flying mountains talking monkeys you don't get that in the bible mm. <laughs> right so um there was this question of civilizational difference because um starting with 1757 at the uh, battle of palashi 1757 yeah, yeah right around that time 1757 i'm I, i'm correct right, i think right yeah yes yeah, uh the battle of palashi that's when the mughal government you know began to weaken the bengals were already under, under the sultans for a long time and um by 1857 a hundred years later with uh mongol pande and uh, what the british called sepoy mutiny and we call the first war of independence mm. uh the the rebellion so to say um you know the 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 fate of the british empire in india was sealed but along with came the question of a moral authority do you have the moral right to be here and in um 
the United States, for example, they drew pictures of a woman walking westward, and they said that this is, you know, uh, what what destiny is it called? Um, uh, it's like I forget the exact term, but it's God ordained that God wanted us to be here in America, and therefore we can take all this land now and turn everybody into Christians. The thing is, Native Americans did not have exposure to foreign diseases for a long time. And that's why beyond the genocide that happened in the Americas, a lot of them also died by disease. Indians, on the other hand, have had foreigners coming in for a long time. Uh, South Asian people, who we kind of colloquially call desis today, uh, and Pakistanis are called desis, and Bangladeshis are called desis, and Indians are called desis, and Nepali people are called desis, and Sri Lankans are called desis. Now, the term Hindu before the colonial period was like the term Desi because Hinduism referred to a culture, whereas Vaishnavism would refer to a religion um, or, or even a spiritual practice. And this is something even scholars today, like Gavin Flood, who is the academic director at Oxford, if some <laughs> studies and a faculty of theology, still say that, let me just finish the sentence. Sure. Um, still say that Hinduism is you know, Hinduism as a re religion gets reified during these times in the you know, 18th, 19th centuries. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur is at the cusp of the formation of Hinduism, where Hindus themselves are divided. There are progressive Hindus like the Brahmos, and there are conservative Hindus like the Smarthas of Bengal. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the politics of what's happening, what Bhaktivinoda Thakur does is he tries to fit in to the middle of these conversations going on and says that, you know, it's not about us versus them. We are on the same planet and we got to share these resources. And in that particular article, he's very clear that if anybody is unethical and if they are cruel, then we should not, we should not take it down, you know, like lame ducks. And so the politics of Bhaktivinoda Thakur is not appeasement of the British, but picking a bigger battle than what his colleagues like Bankim Chandra Chatterjee already picked up during his time. Okay. So if you give the overall picture to so the British felt that they had the moral authority because they considered themselves to be a superior race. And yeah, civilization will be superior. Civilization is superior. And Bhaktivinoda you know, Thakur, the bigger battle he wanted to focus on was refining the Vaishnava identity and presenting it to the world. And uh, so was he not that when he said, if there is immorality, if the government is not good. So uh, was the British plunder of India not evident at that time so much? Or it wasn't. The nationalist movement that we know, I mean, I, th I think we should be very careful about collapsing history, right? Yeah. So 1857, Bhakti Manu Thakur is with Kashi Prashad Ghosh when the rebellion happens. He is a writer for the newspaper called the Hindu Intelligence Year. I haven't been able to procure those newspapers. I've seen two articles written by him, one about women's education and why women should be educated and be a part of mainstream public life in society, right? Um, and he was a regular columnist, and I haven't seen that stuff. But so I am not in a position to comment on his particular take on the uh, 1857 rebellion. But I do know By that... Bhaktivinoda Thakur's? Yes. Okay. okay. But he was a coterie of... He was a part of a coterie of people who were uh, invested in progressive thought in various different ways. Mm. Out of the, all of that, by 1905, when Bengal was divided based on religion, that's when the national movement reached its height. So in the time where Bhaktivinoda Thakur is writing this stuff, the national movement isn't as mature as it was at the time of 1905. By this time, he's already retired and he's gotten into his bhajan. And he's disinterested in worldly politics, but he encourages his children to look at what's going on and write about them and speak about them. And so it's not that he's totally divorced. 
He retired in 1895 or 1896, I think. 96, okay. So it's not that he is just interested in politics okay. is just that he feels I understand through his writings he has said enough where other people can take up and do the things that he was doing okay right and in terms of I just want to make one minor point about refine the Vaishnava identity I would uh, think that the project was quite different it's not about refining Vaishnava identity but uh, unearthing a universal Vaishnavism within what was the Vaishnava identity at that time. Okay. That's so okay. there were already many, many Vaishnavas, but he's picking up the universalist elements so that he can talk to people, like-minded people from other cultures. And uh, what Bhaktivinoda Thakur was doing, I think, is anticipating intercultural communication. Okay. That people from various different cultures who are barely able to engage with each other uh, focus on how they can translate cultural concepts from one culture to another. And he says that in our Hindu culture or in our culture, go Vaishnava culture, we look at uh, various alambanas, the, the objects that create uddipana, the excitement feelings in Rasa, such as, you know, Gopu, Gopi, Bindavan, Tamal tree, Tulasi tree, and so on and so forth. He says future saragrahis will be able to understand Krishna Bhakti very deeply and be able to culturally translate these things so that uh, other people can understand what Mahaprabhu's gift is. And Mahaprabhu's gift is to explain to the world what is rasa. Just a minute. So, so it wasn't about reifying Vaishnava identity. I just want to make that point. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I got that point. So now... When you're talking about a bigger, bigger fighting a bigger battle, so when I was talking about the politics, hmm. I was trying to understand his positioning. Was it a matter of, you could say, a spiritual or a transcendental principle, or was it more a matter of practical strategy? So, uh, when we talk about, uh, at one level, he was working with the government, and as you said, also that the independence movement also had not become very active. I think it was, mm. I think it was just in 19, 1905, I think there was a the Rowlett Act or something like that. Or after the First World War, it became really strong, where they felt betrayed that we were not, we were not benefited. That is, First World War is 1916. 1916 yeah. You know, so, by that time, 1905 also well, something happened. Other like people that. are active, not him. Yeah, 1905 something happened. 1905, the Bengal, the Bengal, parti partition, the Bengal right. partition happened. Yeah, right. So the Bengal I, partition, not the Indian partition. Huh? Right, of course, yeah. So at one level, uh, it, the movement itself had not evolved that much. So when he is choosing to mm -hmm. position himself, say not criticize the British too much, then the idea is that uh, is it that uh, that is not so relevant for us right now? Like you said, establish better cultural contact, connectivity. So was it more a matter of that we, that Krishna consciousness is so transcendental that we don't have to get involved with politics or that is also one area of involvement, but that's not what is most important for us. That's not what is relevant for us. Because the point is that Bhakti Ram Thakur doesn't seem to be too transcendental or otherworldly to me in the way he engages with intellectuals of his times. So that's why I'm trying to understand how engaged, because he was significantly engaged and then to be uh, to be aloof from the political movement of the world, movement of the times, even if it was nascent. So what was the rationale for that as far as you understand it? Yeah. Um, the, you know, one can, if I were to use his commentaries to answer that question, um, you know, the extent of one's ego can go, you know, kind of expand all the way to a nation state and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. And so those whose egos are, or identity, not ego, identity is a better word. Identity is hinged to the body, psychologically speaking, um, are people who have bodily suffering. Now, bodily suffering will continue because pain is inevitable, but suffering is an option. Right. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, 
the less we kind of psychologically tune ourselves, uh, realizing that we're not just this body, then it's easier to deal with bodily suffering. Similarly, when our, somebody in our family is suffering or somebody scratches our car or something happens to our city, we still get affected. And um, that's because our identity is, we, we identify with a community. Now, scholars say that a nation is an imagined community. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur, and this is quite recent, but Bhaktivinoda Thakur, as a member of the British government, I think, was sharp enough to understand that these borders that these people are creating um, are artificial. And the Srimad Bhagavatam talks about a situation in the 10th canto, first chapter, verse 17, when the world is divided up in, by, as Tagore would put it, by narrow domestic walls. And uh, people, unscrupulous people, dressed up or pretending to be um, kind of caring rulers would take advantage of innocent people, right? And so he saw, I think, that the British were in India for trade, but they were also exploiting uh, the labor and the resources of the country. But instead of trying to address the symptoms of the disease that many of his other colleagues like Banki Chandra was doing, he addressed the, what he thought was the intellectu intellectually the root cause of the disease. And the root cause of the disease is to realize um, the, or, or to not realize that um, Mother Earth is most important and Father Dharma, when protected, nourishes Mother Earth. This is in Bhagavat. So his vision was planetary. His vision was not located in India. While others who were engaged in the national movement were thinking only about their motherland, uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, after reading the Bhagavatam and reading Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's life, realized that what is at stake is the future of the planet. And this is not the first time this is happening. Right? At least that's what the Bhagavata says. And so instead of fighting with the British, he addressed the very ideology that brought the British to India to exploit Indians. When you and said, not the first time he used the Srimad Bhagavatam. When you said this is not the first time this is happening, what are you referring to? Invaders coming to India and taking over. India. I'm referring to both. I'm referring to both the incidents mentioned, or the stories mentioned, or the legends mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam, um, as well as the history of India after that. Right. So, what was at stake? So, when, say, for example, we are fighting for our nation, and at that time, you know, the population was less than three uh, koti. Uh, sorry, uh, 1.4 billion, it was about 300 million. Uh, 300 million, 330 crore, something like that. I don't remember the census details from those years. So if Bhaktivinoda Thakur was here and listening to our conversation, he would tell us, I think, that why are you only concerned about just this segment of the world's population? Why not everybody, including animals and plants? Because the British are here and they are doing things, right? But if they leave and we do the same things, what's the point of a national movement? The root cause of this is exploitation and suffering. And that comes from a lack of spiritual education. So let's start there. And this spiritual education needs to reach every corner of the world. And that is why he was writing letters to Emerson and Monier Williams and everybody, these top intellectuals, because he knew that ideas have a life of their own and they trickle down and enter mainstream society. Yeah. And if the leaders and thinkers of society accept what we are saying, then they realize that Krishna Bhakti is not a religion, but rather a science. It is the science of rasa, so to say. Right. And Krishna is Akhila Rasamrita Murti. And once we understand that, then Krishna is no longer a Hindu god, by the way. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur also makes it very clear that Hinduism is my culture, Vaishnavism is my religion. He makes that distinction. 
Interesting. So just to contextualize what you're saying. So you're saying that in a sense, there is a consistency between say what Bhaktisanth Thakur told Prabhupada about the urgency of sharing Krishna consciousness as compared with the pol struggle for political independence. So it is more or less the same strand of thought that goes back to Bhaktisanth Thakur also. It starts with him. Okay. And um, it starts with him. And that's why he's called the pioneer of the worldwide Krishna consciousness movement. Or as I put it, the worldwide bhakti movement or global bhakti yes, movement. That's true. Now, the pioneer of the bhakti movement, that's the, Prabhupada also calls him that. At the same time, you know, the idea of how to engage with the world. So is political aloofness in general a characteristic of Gaudiya Vaishnavism? Because we also see that. No. Because we also see that, say, Rupa and Sanatan Goswami were in influential positions in Nawab Hussain Shah's ministry. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told them to renounce the world and then they went to Vrindavan. And mm -hmm. Pratap Rudra, he was also a king. And then he mostly used his royal resources for, uh, uh, for helping Lord Chaitanya. But it was not mm -hmm. that Lord Chaitanya made him into a very prominent associate. He was an important person. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was significantly reluctant to even meet him. So initially. So, but eventually also, was he routinely meeting him? When yes, um, on and off. Um, but you you finish your question. I want to address the point about so okay so political so, aloof. so how much of like political engagement is mm -hmm. is it? Uh, in, in some ways, Gaudiya Vaishnavism grew on a certain infrastructure. Like you said, Hinduism is my dharma, Hinduism is my culture, and Vaishnavism is my religion. Uh, is that, uh, you said that it's not inherently a characteristic of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. But then I, how do you... I, I, not in my understanding. Okay, so then how do you contextualize or explain these examples? Gaudiya Vaishnavas, Gaudiya Vaishnavas have always been at the forefront of progressive political movements since the time of Lord Chaitanya. And if you think about it this way, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a professor of logic and grammar, a well-known one in Nabadweep. And it was at his time when the Turkish people had captured a lot of places in Bengal and um, were the kind of lawmakers and um, the justice system, the jury judge and executioner as we call it. And, uh, you know, uh, he, he had run in with the government. In fact, the Sankirtan movement was a political movement. Otherwise, why would he go to the house of Chan Kazi? Um, and Gaudiya Vaishnavism has always spread with okay. royal patronage. How are we defining political movement? I would political. say that as a cultural movement, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu never, political movement would mean that he would want to take a political seat of power. He didn't try to change the government. He didn't really, they got a change in the governmental policy that was that, okay, he will not, Chand Kazi will not stop the Kirtan. That is policy, isn't it? I mean, policy is politics. But the purpose of politics is to change policy. Okay. I was thinking of political change in terms of occupying political positions. No, you or, don't, one doesn't need to, one doesn't need to occupy political positions. And also just to finish the uh, older train of thoughts, even Rupan Sanatan Goswamis, Mahaprabhu put, him, put them in Vrindavan very, very strategically because they had experience with the political establishment of the Turkish. Mm, I have heard about that, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, to have the, the ex-finance minister and the chief minister or the prime minister or whatever you want to call it in English terms, stay closest to the seat of power, the Lin Vrindavan are next to each other. To have them at the seat of power to deal with the government was the whole purpose of having them there to maintain Radha Kunda, Shyama Kunda, that Mahaprabhu, I mean, Mahaprabhu just jumped into a rice paddy and said, this is Radha Kunda. Mm -hmm. So it's on the bhav of Mahaprabhu that we accept Radha Kunda to be a sacred tirtha, right? And it was not till the generation of Jiva Goswami, where when the Turkish had left and the Mughals, Mughals had come in, that the Farmans were composed to make sure that these particular 
individuals in Vrindavan, the Goswamis, were the main authorities when it come, came to maintaining the infrastructure of Vrindavan, right? And money was flowing in and pilgrims were flowing in. And Mahaprabhu never left or none of the Goswamis ever left like a formal institution, but the temples were institutions, so to say, right? But the very fact that these temples are made of sandstone, that red colored sandstone, speaks volumes about, say, political involvement with the government. Um, temples that are made with a particular kind of stone and that are of a particular color are temples that have been authorized by the government. Really? Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, the Vrindavan temples, like Madan Mohan temple, before Aurangzeb, it was much bigger. Uh, in, in, the, in their generation, having something like that means that we are with the government. It's just the architecture of the temples itself. Right. And if you look at Kusum Sarovar, which is much later, even that has Mughal architecture. I mean, a lot of Vrindavan, Vrindavan has Mughal architecture. Right. That's true. And, and um, it was only certain Mughal kings who, you know, who felt politically threatened, so to say, by temples that were rising to power. Mm. And those were the temples they targeted and they looted and destroyed or whatever. But it wasn't necessarily about temple desecration all the time. Right. Because there were thousands of temples and not everything was desecrated. But the ones that were, the question is, is it government authorized? Right. Today, you know, a secular government can go and demolish a Shiva temple if somebody builds it in the middle of a highway. Right. Now, it wouldn't necessarily become a fight between secularism and religion. We don't even present that debate in such a way. And we must understand that politics does not necessarily mean sitting in power, but actually knowing the people who are in power so that the policies that is beneficial for everybody becomes mainstream or becomes a part of the, in his time, the royal order. Mm -hmm. In our time, you know, we have Niti Ayog and so and so forth. Okay, right. Right. Now, you know, I think this temples is a big subject and we could discuss it separately also. Uh, yeah. and I appreciate that not all temples were vandalized or plundered because of religious reasons. But clearly there are many temples where the temples were replaced by mosques. And there are temples where the deities were made. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Where the temples were, temple deities were made into, were put into the tiles that made the footsteps of the mosques. Under the stairs, yeah. So, that is true. Stairs, so that's also there. So I appreciate yeah, of that that Bhaktivinoda Thakur, sorry, that Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, they were, they were engaged over there. And we could say Chaitanya Mahaprabhu considered that their being in Vrindavan could be a more important contribution than their being in official position in, in, in Bengal, which is fine. Right. So the, your basic point is that it is not that we are politically aloof, but then we strategically, strategically choose how to be politically engaged. So is yeah, there, I, I, is yeah, there, I just to, uh, sorry, go ahead. So is there any example of, say, the way Bhaktivinoda Thakur positioned himself that helped him to, say, either change government policy or shape government policy or that helped him to maximize his spiritual outreach? Yes. Um, you know, first of all, when a deputy magistrate goes on the streets to dance in Kirtan during his weekends or holidays, you know, it creates a certain furor. And he was very well aware of that. And he used his position. Um, he, I, I think he did the most subtle thing one could do. He resigned from his government position, dressed up like a beggar, and went from door to door begging for the yoga temple that he was constructing in Mayapur. For a person who was honorable. Yeah. I remember reading. For a British deputy magistrate to become a Vaishnav beggar is a huge statement. I think. Yes. Yeah, of course. I remember reading <laughs> the newspaper at that time. Was it the main... And by the way, I think the personal is political. I think the personal is political and the political personal. And that's what Bhaktivinoda Thakur was doing. Okay. Okay, yes. Now this is... I think the Amrit Bazar Patrika also reported about his going, as you said, on the streets and asking for some contribution for the temple. So that was 
quite radical and significant now before that hmm. uh, how rare was his position say when he became the district magistrate any idea how many indians were hmm. there in the position of district magistrate at that time not many not many and the ones who were um were extremely influential extremely so not, influential. not many means like a few dozen or a few hundred i don't know the exact number but roughly i don't know i cannot tell you the exact number i have to look it up i i i i cannot give a number off my head i I'm, i'm not sure um but you know getting into that position was very difficult and um only he he mentioned is in the, in his autobiography how many times he failed <laughs> uh, that is true and he just kept at it and then it happened so the one thing is uh, and yeah, at, at, at that point of time it was also a question of sorry go ahead uh, at that time it was a position of it was also a question of trust who could the british officers in india trust among indians hmm. right and bhaktivinoda thakur was known as somebody who had a lot of integrity in his autobiography he says that you know i tried selling sugar at the big market in calcutta it didn't work because i saw businessmen don't have integrity there and so that was a good quality that the authorities had noticed and on the all the letters that he presents in his autobiography which by the way mandala publishing is printing and another scholar shantanu de and i finished working on it together and we just working on the footnotes and stuff so maybe i don't know maybe next year year after what his letters the biography of uh, the biography of uh, the biography of bhakti bhaktivinoda thakur he presents the letters he had received from your video various british officers your video has gone oh is it let's come back now it's come back um usually it is that my okay internet, can you my internet can is you see problem. usually my internet is the problem but it's oh. the first time it seems your internet is the problem because mine is very very clear and straight no i had a I had a phone suddenly somebody is suddenly trying to call me in the middle of my, that's why I think the video went off for a second. Oh okay fine. So I just, so no what I'm well, sorry can you remind me what you're talking about? So we were talking about uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur using his uh, position uh, to influence the ta- influence his time politically say in shaping policies or optimizing his outreach the way he mm-hmm. positioned himself so one example you gave was of his is just being in his post so i was talking about two distinct things so one is after he resigned that itself is sensational and while he was in that position also uh just being in his position and then talking about krishna bhakti that would also have its influence yes and jason fuller wrote a good dissertation on that on how bhaktivinoda thakur influenced how bhaktivinoda thakur's social position impacted his preaching work or preaching work is in the right term you know his his um his activities his uh his organizational activities in bihar bengal and orissa okay that's fascinating so overall uh, were there any say overt uh, or manifest influences so because he was in that position so he could maybe travel more freely or he could encourage people and people took him seriously so that part he couldn't travel freely if yeah. he was stuck to wherever he was posted and sometimes he would plead again and again please send me to krishnanagar please send me to krishnanagar <laughs> because that's also where i think his spiritual life or his existential life and his uh, career intersected um intersected means pulled into during no came together came together and met because um initially he was thinking i have done enough government service i have earned enough let me go to bandavan and retire and then he had a dream that um, there is so much to be done in mahapuru's area you know you you focus on bengal do in bengal what the goswamis did in bandavan so what the goswamis did in bandavan for krishna you do in bengal for mahaprabhu in tanandapur and that is when he decided not to go and that was when you know he had this mystic vision about bollal dehi mm-hmm. and uh, it was also a time and there if i may kind of slide into the point about uh, culture yeah please um there was also a time where 
you know, various segments of Bengali and Indian society were suddenly taking interest in Lord Chaitanya. Right. Mm. And um, there were the Vaishnavas who had maintained the traditions for hundreds of years in their family. And the good thing was tradition was thus maintained, but the uh, not so good thing was these people thought of their job as their hereditary birthright. And uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur did not fight against that. That was not a battle he picked, but Saraswati Thakur picked it on his behalf. Mm. The Krishna Bhakti is not something that can be limited to a small group of people who claim you know, authority over it, but it is an exact science. And I don't mean it in the sense of an empirical science or a positivist science, um, which is mostly mechanistic, but rather a subjective science of emotions that was uh, replicable anywhere on planet earth. And that is the characteristic of what I mean by science. It is, you know, you have a hypothesis and then you do an experiment, you come up with the results. And when you can repeat the experiments at very place, many places and the results are still the same, then you can say that that was a scientific experiment. So uh, there is some scholarship. Some scholars have written about subjective science and subjective science is, I I would call it the the theory of rasa is a subjective science uh, from uh, ancient and early modern India. And uh, in the, in the, in in the cultural landscape of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, people had, limited it within certain circles, thinking that these are not for everybody. And in some cases they were right, but in many cases Bhakti Vinotaku disagreed. And therefore he made it a more egalitarian thing, saying that uh, egalitarianism is in, in keeping with the mood of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Right. So there were several people, one were the Bhadralooks of Bengal, the Babus, so to say, uh, who could speak English? Okay. Before you want to Bhadraloka, that's important. So when you said egalitarianism is in keeping with Lord Chaitanya's spirit of outreach. So that's and Nitananda Prabhu's spirit even more. Yeah, of course, definitely. So that was very important. So now, when we talk about the culture at that time, hmm? Hmm. so in one sense, there was uh, the traditional, like the Smartha Brahmanas, you also mentioned they were conservative at that time. But uh, they, did, they were not really the shapers of the cultural renaissance that was happening. So from what That's, I... No, well, they were. They were. They were always a major cultural force from the time of Ramohan. And whether it was, you know, widow remarriage act, no matter what, like whatever the Brahmos did, the Smarthas were opposite. And so Bhaktivinoda Thakur had to deal with the Brahmos in his early life, the Christians in his early life, then the Bhadraloks in Bengal, right, who were Western educated skeptics, so to say, and then the Smarthas, and then uh, the various groups of people who, who claimed Vaishnava identity but had no clue about what they were doing. And uh, you know, and these were the Otibaris and Kartavhaja groups like that. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur also respected them. Like he had, he writes in his autobiography that he was cured by a Kartavhaja Vaishnava guru when he was very young. Kartavhaja is what uh, a lot of English translators called deviant sects. One of the deviant sects. So deviant from Vaishnava or deviant from Hinduism? Or deviant from what? Deviant from Goswami literature. Okay. So he was, but they were Vaidyas, huh? they were medical, they, they cured him. They cured him when he was very young and they gave him a mantra. That was his first initiation, so to say. And he respected them. And then um, it was when he, in Puri, he met his um, first Shiksha Guru, so to say, uh, who had initially protested, saying, why are you gathering without be, being an authorized Vaishnava? Because some people would gather at the Mukti Mandap uh, right outside the main entrance of Lord, uh, Jagannath's gate. 
and they were discussing mostly kind of smart philosophy and Bhakti Vinod Thakur used to meet up with his group of people on the other side, on the, on the, um, where, where is that? Um, that's the, the northern, near the northern gate where Mahaprabhu's footprints are there. And then the Vaishnavas took exception and said, you know, why are you doing this? And he's, that's when he realized that he has to be initiated to be a part of community. This is so a initiation is, this is in Jagannath Puri. Okay. I forget the name of the Babaji right now. And then much later, he took uh, initiation from Bipin Bihari Goswami. Mm. And in the tradition, in the tradition that Bhakti Thakur received, there are about 15 Gayatris. Um, and uh, Saraswati Thakur didn't accept the whole thing. Saraswati Thakur only accepted the segment of the Gayatris that were related to the renunciates of the tradition. And what Saraswati Thakur tried doing, uh, and this was on the instructions of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, was to create a monastic order within Gaudiya Vaishnavism, which was not there at that point. Mm. You know, that is a very interesting subject. You know, we can also maybe have a separate discussion in the future about how Bhakti sure. Vinod Thakur carried on the legacy of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. That's a very important aspect. Just Many people carried on the legacy, but he was the one who carried on the legacy in terms of monastics. Okay. That's true. So just, uh, but just to elaborate on this point, that when he felt the need for yes, to be a part of the community, so see at one mm-hmm. level, we are analyzing these as consciously thought strategic decisions. Mm-hmm. Now, in the way within the tradition, we see our teachers. Say for example, if you read Prabhupada's Lilamrit, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it is, we talk about what Prabhupada did and mm-hmm. uh, we don't say, say okay, he, he res- deal with, dealt with the situation this way, or dealt with that situation that way. But uh, we don't really see this kind of analysis that okay, that Prabhupada, okay, these were the these were the social cultural forces at that time, and Prabhupada was responding to them, and Prabhupada was taking a particular position. So, hmm. so for to to that this question has two parts. First is that uh, mm, is this approach. Uh, of analyzing the socio-cultural or socio-political factors Mm. uh, to understand how a Vaishnava has approached. Mm. Is this a part of the Vaishnava tradition itself? Because I see academic scholars do it, but but we don't see this in the hagiographies of Prabhupada, uh, generally speaking. Now, to some extent... It may not be... Well, there are... Yogeshwar Prabhu's book, for example, Swami in a Strange Land, mm. does that. Um, and there are other older books. I think Bhakti Vikas Maharaj's book also, Bhakti Sans Vaibha, does, does, that. does that to some extent. Yeah, but other books, uh, you know, they don't do it in the same language and the same modes that we do today. The genre has changed. But even books like, you know, uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita has, but Hans going around and, you know, uh, Mahaprabhu says, don't, don't, don't bother my friends. I just have epilepsy. Remember during one of his travels, he met these uh, soldiers, Turkish soldiers. Okay. So you're saying, soldier, I forget. So how are you related? So the, very pres- the very presence of the incidents that are happening in relation to these people shows that there are all these other characters. I think that the books that we have, need to be meditated on rather than just read. That's true. In those times, they didn't have videos. Otherwise, you know, 500 years from now, they're going to have videos of people like us talking to each other. And they're going to have some other technology, which we don't even have an idea about. Mm. Right? But we are leaving behind our digital digital footprint and we are trying our best to leave a message for our future generations that is going to help them, you know, literally save the planet. If you look at the Srimad Bhagavatam, it starts with the planet is in distress and it ends with Bhumi Gita. And if you look at the Mahabharat, Krishna says very, very clearly that my first commitment is for the well-being of Dharma and this planet. Right? And so even politically speaking, to go back to the first point, I'll just make a very small two-minute um, spiel here. The, pol- the politics of the Bhagavad, if you really talk about it, is basically ethical politics. 
it's not about winning elections or being in a position of power. It's the politics of practicing satya, socha, tapa, and daya. Mm. Right? True. Uh, that means no matter what, we don't want to compromise with our integrity. We want to be clean in our dealings and in our hygiene and all of that. Uh, we need to practice restraint and put in effort. That's tapa. But most important is to be kind and compassionate, be nonviolent, is daya. The practice of Satya Sochitapa Daya is the politics of Sri Krishna himself. And if you look at the Bhagavatam, you will see that even when the Yadu dynasty is, you know, his own children and grandchildren and great grandchildren are killing each other, his response to that is these people have become unethical. Why would they, why would they try to cheat a saintly person? Right? And so to be aware of the ethics of bhakti is paramount. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur used to say all the time, Aage you first become a human being, then you can become, think of becoming a Vaishnava. And becoming a human being means following these four ethical values. Can you repeat that? Aage Vaishnava, Aage Manusha. Aage Manusha. Aage first become a human being. <laughs> Manusha is first grow up. Aage Manusha ho, ba, tare, or ba, tare, pore. Yeah, I think something similar to uh, you know, first become conscious, then become Krishna conscious. Or yeah, something like that. First so we can develop yeah. humane qualities, then we can develop spiritual qualities. Good. Yeah, and what Prabhupada translated as the four regulatory principles are these four principles of Dharma. Yeah. Right. And in our tradition, there are Vidhis and Nishedas. And I think we spoke about it before. Yes. Uh, this is a good point. Uh, positive principles. No, that's fine. I think this is you know, and the politics that. Uh, yeah, just one minute. So it's a good point that the politics of ethics. I think a major difference, uh, if we go toward the past, the times of the Bhagavatam is that the main central characters there are kshatriyas, and in that sense, they get directly involved in the ruling of the kingdom. So whereas. In the recent times, the main mm. characters who are uh, who are spreading dharma, mm. or who, about whom we hear, they are mm. mostly brahmanas, sannyasis. The kings are there. If you see the center, if you look at, look at the whole bhakti literature, or right from the time of Shankaracharya onwards, mm. uh, central religious figures mm. are either renunciates or brahmanical teachers, or a combination of both. But if you look back at the time of the epics, the renunciates are, are significant religious figures, but the epics are written about the, the central figures in them are kings. So in that mm -hmm. sense, there is a greater intersection of, say, politics and uh, spirituality centered, as you said, on ethics in the epics than it is in the recent Indian tradition. Mm -hmm. So it also depends on the societal role which a particular person is playing, how much they get involved. So no, when I asked that question about, about uh, analyzing a particular uh, Acharya's actions in terms of their social contexts. Mm -hmm. So the question I was, uh, why I was asking this is in today's, today's world, uh, there is an increasing trend, at least in India, that I see in the Indian community devotee community also, some devotees feel that we as a movement are too transcendental. That means, okay. uh, <laughs> that means, <laughs> you know, that maybe there are Christians who are aggressively converting or yeah. there, are secular, there are leftist scholars who are aggressively misrepresenting or just there is, mm, there is increasing materialism because of westernization. Now we could go into the specifics yeah. of each of these factors, but the idea is that for people to come up to the level of practicing Krishna Bhakti as uh, is presented in ISKCON. The number of people who are going to come up to that is, is not going to be very high. Hmm. And that's why we need to network with other organizations or other groups to protect hmm. Dharma. Now Dharma can, as you said, it can mean uh, the, four, uh, the, the four values of Dharma. 
at least for example protect cows protect deities and protect something like that it can also mean countering conversion it can also mean protecting national integrity but at least to some extent uh there is india is the land of dharma so the idea is that how much so although our acharyas have taken positions which are significantly we could say transcendental focusing on transcendental but the way you analyze it that it was it is not transcendental because the political is insignificant but rather they took a position they were choosing a battle by which they could if they could influence the temporal in the most effective way that is correct so so if devotees today feel inspired to mm-hmm. engage say with national with with those who are nationalist activists those who are say wanting to anti conversion activists or those who want to protect or counter misrepresentations of dharma in the culture say our sacred icons are sometimes misrepresented or maligned mm-hmm. so those the, these are not directly devotional activities so but mm-hmm. those who want to do these uh, how much would this kind of this kind of activism be in in continuation of our tradition or would it be something which is uh, divergent from what has been done in our tradition it first address your point about kings becoming exemplars um we also have to see uh, the various patronage systems as well as ground root like grassroots level composition of literature and we have both courtly literature as well as uh proletariat literature within vaishnava among, among vaishnavas and um what was uh, and in terms of political involvement you know i mean the the idea is very simple it is better to do one's own dharma imperfectly than to do somebody else's dharma perfectly right and political engagement you know in in my um understanding uh will create more problems if they are not done from the platform where one has developed the right insight and the the the, the required amount of of compassion and you that do you know about the cobra effect this is one of the uh, I, you know ideas that gets floated flo- you know, keeps floating around it first appeared i think in the free economics uh, blog have you are you aware of that the cobra effect you can i can tell you briefly yeah please if you if you so it is said and nobody knows if it's historically true or not um that during the british period delhi had a, a infestation of cobras and the government came up with a plan saying that if you bring dead cobras we will give you some money and the number of cobras that began pouring in were way more than what they had estimated and then they started investigating and figured out that the farmers are outside of delhi now had cobra breeding farms and people would go and buy cobras and sell it to the government you know just to make some money and the government figured it out and said all right we're going to stop no more money for cobra and the farmers thought okay it's not profitable anymore so they let the cobras go <laughs> and before you knew it there were way more cobras around delhi than they had started with now i'm saying that to point to the teachings of prahlad in the seventh canto of the shrimad bhagavatam where he says that when you try to create solutions in this world often it ends up creating bigger problems yeah dukkha ushadam and to engage in politics without sorry dukkha ushadam tadapi dukkham atadhiya he says the exact and so to engage in politics without first thinking through without the training is uh, going to create more problems and i had a conversation with gurudev prabhu some time back uh, well 2016 and he says when you have somebody in charge of a university a president of a university how much experience does that person need how many times is that person vetted right why is it that 
somebody who wants to win a popularity contest gets to do that and take charge of our lives without the qualifications. Right? Okay, so this is a... And it's a good point. It's a very it's good, a good point. point. So, so the critique of populism, now we yeah. go into the discussions about how politics are engaged in, in today's world. And then you know, maybe democracy is the best among all bad bargains that it's not about a, it's not about democracy. It's about it's about uh, because democracy is not a monolithic thing. There are various forms of democracy. American democracy looks very different from British democracy, which is very different from Indian democracy. There are many democracies, right? But, but I, my point is very simple: that if we engage in any form of politics without cultivating the insight and the compassion to be able to deal with problems that impact people's lives and create suffering, then we will not have empathy and we will create solutions that will create bigger problems. And so Prabhupada started the Srimad Bhagavatam with the preface, we must understand the present need of human society. We are no longer bound by small walls anymore, right? We have made rapid progress in the areas of education, uh, you know, economy and so on and so forth. But we have a pinprick somewhere, right? And Srimad Bhagavatam is going to address that pinprick. Okay. Right? That's Prabhupada's politics. I agree with you about this point. That's definitely true uh -huh. that we, if we get a position of influence and mm -hmm. if we are both, you know, there has to be some spiritual caliber and also there has to be material competence. If either of them is lacking, mm -hmm. there can be a lot of problems that can result from it. So no doubt about that. That's right. That's true. At the same time, do we, so that, that this, but this fact applies in every area of life. And if somebody becomes a doctor. Absolutely. If they're not competent or if Absolutely. they're not compassionate. So Absolutely. There is, there is no need. And that answers your question. So, so there is no need to say, <laughs> to put politics in a category different from everything else. To engage with the world, exactly, we need competence and we need, you could say, compassion, both, or you want to call, call it character right. in general, which can include compassion. So that means unless we have both, if we if not just character and compassion, but also insight, insight, intelligence. You can have a you can have a very strong character. You can have a lot of compassion. That's what is it, competence. But if you don't have competence and insight, then you are still going to create a disaster. Agree, no doubt about it. So, so it's not that, in a sense, as a movement, we are struggling to manage our own movement. So, what to speak of managing? The world. <laughs> <laughs> because so, we are trying to manage it in the first place. There is nothing to manage. Prabhupada said very clearly that you know I don't know how things are running. Mahaprabhu is doing it. I just simply sit, write these books, and sing Hare Krishna. Hmm. And so, and he's told us very, very clearly: don't create bureaucracy. Don't create unnecessary management. First, create temple goers, then create temples. And because out of our over enthusiasm, we have not listened to some of the instructions of our Acharya Vargas. Rupa Goswami said one should not take up too many projects because it's destruction, it, it, it will destroy Bhakti. Hmm. I mean, that's a big subject. It is like that. that particular... That's another subject for another time. But I'm saying that, you know, without insight, compassion, competence, and character, if we try to take anything up, Hmm. We will end up creating bigger problems than the solutions we are trying to solve. Uh, problems we are trying to solve. Agreed, agreed. So the idea is that see, politics is not like a one untouchable category. So we are transcend. No, why should it be? Yeah. So we. So why it's should, not that as why a. should it be? If a devotee is competent, a devotee can start a big com uh, start a company and become a CEO of a company. If a devotee Absolutely. is competent, as you said, they might become the head of department of a particular uh, university, or they might become the dean of a university. So, and if a devotee is competent, they might enter into politics also. So, but exactly. the point is that, so it's not that political disengagement is a matter of spiritual principle in our tradition. It is not. No, a, it isn't. It not, isn't. Not, no, it isn't. So, so we could say that it is more a matter of, we have a, we have a spiritual purpose and mm -hmm. then we have to intelligently see how best we can pursue that spiritual purpose. So, Absolutely. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur, and Srila Prabhupada also. Now, if you consider Srila Prabhupada as he started a political party in, in God We Trust. In God We Trust. Yeah. 
but then i was talking with balwant prabhu he said that initially prabhu was very enthusiastic but when he came to know about the extent of financing required to actually run a political candidature so then prabhupad said that prabhupad did not then prabhupad did not back so much and then when balwant prabhu asked him prabhupad are you not are you not interested in this prabhupad said i am interested just don't ask me for any money so <laughs> don't don't ask me for any money i mean tulsi gabbard is uh yeah hindu prashi practices um you know nam jap bhakti yoga and yeah. she ran for president and yeah. she had quite some campaign funding and yeah so she may be one of the good examples that we have for the future that is true and then also you know if somebody going to enter into politics then they will have to choose their battles so you know you cannot just expect yeah. somebody who enters into politics to adhere to all the principles of dharma to the same degree so that is something which is uh, like some devotees took a strong objection that she is a part of the democrats where the democrats often are quite pro choice and mm. they support abortion but you know that is a we cannot simply take devotional values and expect a devotee to enter into politics with all those values intact exactly as they are Yeah, have, just because a professor knows calculus doesn't mean that a three-year-old is suddenly going to start solving calculus problems. Everybody has their own benchmark of uh, standards and education, and you know, if somebody who has only spent one or two years uh, beginning their devotional lives or their ex, you know existential questioning, and to suddenly expect that they are going to become a siddha swarup and you know um, <laughs> transcendental something. No, so you are saying that Tulsi Gabbard is like, like a three-year-old student. Is that what you're comparing? No, 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 no. To 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 expect certain standards from people who are not even there. Why should why my standards be the standards for somebody else? Okay. Each one of us are a unique individual, and in traditional Gaudiya Vaishnava circles, even something as simple as how many rounds are you going to chant every day. Is a decision between a guru and a disciple. Yeah, that's you know this. And Prabhupada like, was saying that even if you cannot do anything else, at least minimum chant sixteen rounds. That means you can engage, be engaged in any form of material activity at least an hour and a half a day. You focus on this thing if you're serious about it. That's true. So, okay, so so this is a important uh, polit- this point of our political positioning. So a devotee, Prabhupa. So Prabhupa, for example, as giving the example in God we trust, Prabhupa felt that the financial resources we had would be more effectively used to create create infrastructure, maybe write print books, build temples, rather than to fund a political campaign. So it's more right. of a, it's more of a strategic decision than rather a matter of principle. In principle, a devotee can engage in whatever profession they want to. and each profession will have its own challenges which they will have to negotiate so and devotees will have to individually decide how they can be most effective and as a movement yeah. the our tradition has largely been we could say a political in terms of not directly taking specific political positions so no we have always taken the political position of uh, you know, on a based on an ethical platform and uh and on when it came to some public sankirtan i mean think about it the very public sankirtan itself is an act of civil disobedience as prabhupada calls it and that's a political movement okay no no i think this is a different when i say a, po- a political position means it's supporting a particular party or a particular ruler Oh 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 oh! I see, I see. Um, no, we never never done that. The other thing I want to bring to your notice is the distinction between politics and governance, or you know, winning an election and running a government. There are two very different things. Uh, politics is uh, the process of getting mandate of the people, at least in democracies. political theories are basically how you are going to distribute resources and you know try to benefit the maximum number of people and governance is the everyday process of doing that right and that's why i think it was obama who said 
you know, running a campaign is one thing, running a government is something completely different. Yeah, that's true. Right? So when we come to politics, I think we have to be very clear that Vaishnavs never, as far as I know, never attempted to suddenly sit themselves, seat themselves in positions of power except for certain circumstances when they were asked to do that. For example, Nityananda Prabhu. Mahaprabhu asked him to go to Bengal and get married, even though he was a sannyasi uh, and about 13 years older. And Nityananda Prabhu went and became some sort of a jamindar. Right? He held land, which is now Karda, north of Calcutta. And after going there, he used to wear a lot of gold. And, you know, he was, um, any scholar would say that he was quite a flashy person. <laughs> you know? And uh, he, he, he practiced the politics of humility and tolerance. But then, you know, we have women leaders within his movement um, is also a significant political statement when women are not a part of public discourse, right? To have Vasudha and Janava uh, engage with his followers, especially Janava Devi travel freely, show her face in public. This was unthinkable in that time because women had to be behind the parda. Their voices should not be heard in public. And if anybody gets to interact with them, they need to be allowed inside the houses under mahal. And once you get into a houses under mahal, you are either very intimate with the husband or the wife or somebody is here to plunder your country. <laughs> in, a, in a socio-cultural situation like that, to have leaders irrespective of who they were, to go out and do things and lead congregations is a huge political statement, if you ask me. Each of our acharyas did not engage in street fighting, did not engage in battles, did not engage in wars to become kings or princes, but they had the mandate of the people because they engaged with societies from an ethical platform. And if you, if you look at the entire movement, Mahaprabhu encapsulates it in Samandha Vidya Prayojan. Samandha in practice is the practice of Dharma. Okay, okay, just one minute. Huh? This, is, this is a significantly different point and we'll come to that. So when you are now, it's like you're expanding the conception of what we mean by political. So as I said, political, we will not be directly taking positions of official power but mm. what you're saying is that we were that devotees had positions of influence social influence even if they were not, not politically appointed or politically elected or whatever politically captured in any way and those positions right. came from came from their uh, spiritual caliber or it came from their ethical strength whatever we want to use it and they use that influence society so in a sense that's right. to, so, to change social policy that's what so, so we are giving the example of uh, Nityanand Prabhu and uh, Janwa Devi hmm. that is an example of uh, we could say reshaping the existing social structures in a way that is that is that is uh, conducive for the for the spreading of bhakti or the spreading of spiritual consciousness See, so bhakti that, itself is emancipatory in all its senses, yeah. right? Um, and um, for example, the movements of Narottam Thakur, right? Or even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself is a political statement even within a Hindu community by establishing who is in charge. Because Chankazi did not come to attack Mahaprabhu's Kirtan at Srivash's place, Srivasangan, because uh, neighbors complained. But it was particularly the Smarta Brahmanas who complained, saying that this guy is destroying Hinduism. Mm. The singing and dancing is not a part of our culture. And Chaitanya wouldn't have any of it. Right? So it was a tripartite political battle, if you look at it that way. 
And he organized 100,000 people, at least according to the geographies or biographies. And he comes in and he makes a huge statement. He says, you know, if you are in my country, and the thing is, Yavana literally means a foreigner. Ionian, like Greek, but the Turkish were called Greek for whatever reason. You know, they came from the same side, <laughs> Northwest. Um, if you are here, then you have to live with us on our terms. That was the political essence of the dialogue between Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Chankazi. And Chankazi had police where he, that he had used to stop Kirtan, but uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu showed who was in control, that he had popular support. If that is not political, I don't know what political is. I'm not saying he had to govern. Hmm. Politics is not governance. But politics is to show that you have clout in society and you have some influence in the way culture runs, religion runs, and economy runs. Those are the three main strands of our daily life. The food we eat, the clothes we wear, food. culture, religion, and economics. Culture, religion, and economics. Okay, so economics is clear enough. How do you differentiate between culture and religion? Religion, religion is a part of culture that has you know, existentialist truth claims. So culture could also have it, but that is not the center in culture. Culture is... Yeah, religion, religion, yeah, religion, the, see, first of all, we have to understand the word religion is an English word and religion does not mean dharma. That's That's dharma true. can have a very wide application. Yeah, it can mean done justice, done. it can mean duty, right. right. That's true. Uh, religion, huh? That's perfectly true. Dharma and religion are very different. So if yeah. I just put it this way, say, culture, religion, and economics, if I'm living in the world... Say there is a reality beyond and how I approach and interact with that is religion. And well, not just that, there's more to that. Okay, but just to give a broad framework to it, then mm. economics is you know how I function, I contribute to society, and I get my needs from society. How wealth gets so just to kind of put it in context, um, religion is the act of meaning making. Okay. Economics is the act of distributing resources. Okay. And culture is the normative standards on which society is going to run. Beautifully put. So when we say religious culture, then what we would mean is those normative standards also contribute to meaning making. Exactly. Okay. So within... You know, say Gaudiya Vaishnavas, people might wear saffron, tilak, white, blue, whatever. And that's cultural. One can still be a brahmachari in any, I mean, St. Francis of Assisi, do you think he's not a great saint? Hmm. Bhaktivana Thakur writes an article called Krishthori Doi Bhaishnav Dharman Doi called talking about John Newman, the theologian. Oh, John, he wrote about him. Huh? John yeah. And he says that this person is a Vaishnav. Oh, it's clearly a Vaishnav and um, there are Vaishnavs who wear Mala and Tilak, but they are, they are Bharavahi Vaishnavs. They are externally Vaishnavs, but they're not really Vaishnavs. But there are Christians who are Vaishnavs. Right? That means Vaishnavism is the mode of meaning making in life. Whereas culture is Hindu and it could be European culture. It could be Arab culture. And this is why when Prabhupada goes to Tehran and he listens to the Azan in the morning, he says, oh, that is also God conscious. Mm, beautiful. When he, when he goes to Dallas and he looks at the church and he says, don't remove these benches because it is their cultural tradition to sit and pray to God in that way. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that in the Chaitanya Shikshamrita and the Krishna Samhita and many articles in the Satan Toshani that... You know, the, the, the test of any culture is whether, you know, you are, you, you have found out the meaning in life. And there are five ways of doing that. Shakta, Shorya, Shreva, Ganapati, and Vaishnava. That's Vaishnava a, meaning in life. Huh? Yeah, that's a fascinating hierarchy. You know, we could discuss that also sometime. So, but just, just coming back sure. to what you're saying is, 
that politics is the way of influencing these three areas of life religion culture and economics is that they are they are like a, they are like three corners of a triangle they are all interdependent and how is this politics related with that are politics influence politics the politics politics, politics ha- and religion have a lot to do with each other no but polit- when, there are policies which affect society in all its walks so can we say politics yes. is the politics is essentially the way of shaping uh, policies that influence all of these say religion so primarily culture. primarily the distribution of resources that's what politics boils down to okay that's interesting and and then when distribution the question of distribution of resources is taken care of what do you do with the extra time and then all these cultural artifacts come into being you create art you create sculpture you create recipes you create dresses music drama literature that's where culture comes in so right in a sense okay, just to, to go back a little bit at when say mm-hmm. you when the moguls were ruling india mm-hmm. uh, in some ways or even when the british were ruling india you know mm-hmm. once they stabilized they were not their primary purpose it was economics yeah. so in a sense they left the religion and the culture to itself at least the british i think bakhtiyar thakur writes how you know, they initially had jagannath temple worship was going on they would have their soldiers shoot guns when lord jagannath would come out and at least initially they were a little deferential but as long as yeah. our economics are taken care of you do what you want with your religion and your culture yeah but later on they expand, ex- expanded and they tried to convert also in, in in fact the east india company was made in about 1600 and 1813 the charter act was passed in british parliament and during those periods when the british came to india they were they practically you know became patrons of uh, rich hindu people in fact <laughs> one time i remember i was going to calcutta airport it's a short anecdote uh, to receive uh, radhanath swami and they were making the new calcutta airport at that time your video went off by the way oh okay and um they were digging the ground for the foundation and somebody i had to change some money and somebody came to me with a bag of coins uh that that was buried under the ground 200 years back and those were old east india company coins and i put i mean those coins were expensive if you wanted to buy it from a thing but the laborers they had no idea and it was like just selling it away for 50 bucks so i bought bought a whole bunch of coins and each of those coins had sita ram and lakshman and said east india company east india company coins with hindu iconography right mm. and many of many hindu temples were patronized by the british because it is a normal standard in indian history for governments to patronize temples mosques gurudwaras and so on and so forth right okay and when did anika write an interesting incident in about the babri masjid in her book I don't know where she got this from but she referenced it around 1857 the british government decided that they want to put in a railing <laughs> going to the babri masjid right where hindus and muslims were both going hindus were worshiping ram and muslims were doing their prayers fried prayers and stuff and i don't know how much of it is like hearsay or how much of it i haven't looked into this but apparently when they made the railing they left a lot of space for hindus and very little space for muslims inside the mosque and that that is the same year when the court cases between the hindus and muslims started about ram janmabhoomi and babri masjid 1857 so and so british policies british policies in india were deliberately and i'm not saying this this is good scholarship were deliberately made to divide and conquer the indigenous population that's true the divide and rule was a strategy actually and 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 it was western definitions of religion that got imposed on indigenous cultures and therefore we have so much confusion a great book to read in this regard is the harvard professor wilfred kentmill smith's book called meaning and end of religion that the idea the category of religion itself is a christian category and 
even though they take away Christianity, that category still applies. In a sense, it's like Angres to gaya, lekin Angrezi rakke gaya. I was talking with a friend a few days back saying, I want to learn a foreign language. I said, you're already talking to me in a foreign language. He says, what, what, what do you mean? He says, you're talking to me in English. <laughs> That's a beautiful way of putting English it. is a foreign language. You, must, you might have mastered it, but doesn't mean it's not a foreign language. Yeah. So just let me see, understand the, uh, the train of thought over here. So uh, what you are saying is that we were having this... Uh, politics as primarily concerned with economics in a way that does not interfere with people's religion or culture that was there initially even with the British East India Company. That's what you told from that anecdote. Well, they did influence. No, no, but it's not that they never influenced, no, no, but the extent, policies did not want to. The okay. policy was, okay, the yeah. British policy was missionaries should not come into our territories. And that and there were many colonies. Said, yeah, as you said, history, we can't monolithize it. That at a particular time they were more favorable, they might have been less intrusive, later they became more intrusive. That's also possible. But the two incidents yeah. you're in that context, the Babri Majid incident and the Coins incident, as two distinct examples of how the politics can shape the religion and culture and can exactly. be in harmony or can foster disharmony. Isn't that? Yeah. And it boils down to individual motives at the end of the day individual motives of people who are in power. Uh, if their motive is to serve, then, you know, then politics, see, at the end of the day, you cannot make everybody happy, but at least, you know, everybody is taken care of. And dharmic politics, so to say, just to conclude this discussion, is there in that verse, Namo Brahmana Devaya Go Brahmana Hitaya Char Jagad Hitaya Krishnaya Govindaya the cows are the most vulnerable species in any human society, social ecosystem. If you go to any supermarket in America, uh, look at the dairy aisle. That's not buffalo milk. That's not camel milk. That's not horse milk. That's cow's milk. Right? And what has happened, if you, if you think of it as alienation of labor, because capitalism is alienation of labor, right? Uh, labor from the laborer. That means if I work something on, you know, because you know, you know the two, three different points have come up before you go into capitalism. It just struck me, cows are the most vulnerable animals. That's I what I said. No, that, no, you said that I never thought of it that way. See, among the various animals that we see, in a sense, cows don't, are not really very, very equipped with defensive resources. A bull at no. least has some resources, but a cow doesn't have so in a sense, we could say that a culture that protects cows, it's a, it's a culture, we could say that it represents its attitude towards the most vulnerable members of that ecosystem. Exactly right. Exactly right. There you go. <laughs> you know, it's um, surprising, but I never, in all the discussions on cow care and cow protection that I have read, I have never read till now about the cow's special vulnerability and how this, the cow's value, we have talked about it. The cow's cultural value, economical value, but the cow's vulnerability is a very striking point. Is this something? Yes, the thing is, within within human societies, you know, when the 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 domestication of animals is an important aspect of human civilization. To have dogs who can protect horses, you can ride cows. You know, I mean, what do cows? What are cows good for? Hmm. Around the world, you see people drinking cow's milk. And they are the most vulnerable creature in a human economy, right? When chickens, for example, are not even standard food. Um, and nobody thinks of eating eggs because, you know, I mean, <laughs> who would do that? At the same time, the Brahmanas, the intellectuals of society, uh, are also the most precious and the vulnerable people because they don't have defense mechanisms. They, you know, they are intellectuals. They work in ways where they're not going to go out for war or work in the field. Mm. And there is a very uh, interesting anecdote from the time of uh, Kalidasa, when the king was some, somebody came and says, why are you paying this poet so much money and he's doing, sitting, sitting doing nothing? And the king said, to run a kingdom, you need him. 
And he said, why? And she says, I'll prove it to you. He says, look at this little piece of wood in front, lying in front of you. Describe it. And this person says, why? Shushkan, Kashtan, Krishthiti, Agri, a dry piece of wood is in, in, in front. He says, Kalidas, what is it? And Kalidasa says, Nirjara Taruvara Pura Vabhage. A little, <laughs> a tree that has lost its life is lying, lying in the east. How beautiful. Right? So even language has its own power. The Mimangsakas knew it. Mm-hmm. And to come back to the idea of cows and brahmanas, uh, brahmanas are not fake brahmanas, not people who just wear a brahmin thread. Yeah. But brahmanas are intellectuals, uh, the, lead, the thought leaders of society. And cows are the, these are the two most vulnerable people. And Krishna is so important in Indian culture because he, of all people, realized the value of these two categories in society and did everything to protect them. Right? The other thing, sick people, old people, animals, children, and women in vulnerable positions. This is there in our Dharma Shastras. Yeah. These are the five most vulnerable segments of human society. And if we do not protect these five people, then we are not a civilized society. So you mentioned- Now, whichever systems of government we have, right? I was just reading the work of, a, I think, a French anthropologist who was looking, who, who digs up bones, human bones, and does research on Neanderthals and other early forms of species that were there. And somebody asked her, how would you define the beginning of human civilization? And she said, by discovering the first time there was a bandage on someone's leg. Because in the animal kingdom, when somebody gets injured, they are left behind as food for the others. Somewhere, some person decided, I will risk my life and make sure that this person is doing okay, even if I don't feel the pain, and took the time to heal this person. That is civilization. Right? So just to go back now, because you said this would be the, uh, like a conclusive summarization of, what are the words used? Say spiritual politics or Vaishnav politics, that Namo Brahmani Devaya, Go Brahmani Taicha, this verse. So what do you say? Jagat Hitaya, Jagat Hita, the whole planet. So, so in a sense, the purpose of political administration is by, by taking care. So how we are taking care of the most vulnerable members of society, that is an indicator of how we will eventually take care of the whole society. That's right. The whole and ecosystem. The whole ecosystem. Yeah, not just society. Jagatitaya Krishna. Govindaya Namo Namaha. Okay. That's beautiful. You know, it's amazing how verses can be expanded to, now, I don't think anybody would have thought of seeing a political political insight in this verse. Well, that's beautiful. You did. No, you did. It. You did that. <laughs> Thank you. So, so if we consider what Bhaktivinoda Thakur did, just to put it round now, that he focused on how best we could further the wisdom, the Vaishnava wisdom. But spread the Vaishnava wisdom by which societies by which society could be benefited, and then according he pos- he positioned himself that okay mm. instead of getting into the political independence struggle he could focus on the the taking the position the existential roots of suffering exist that's a beautiful way of putting it and then how to address them in, by pre- by presenting the universal aspects of the, or the universe, not the aspects, the universality of Vaishnavism itself. In a, Bhakti, in a way, yeah, Krishna Bhakti. Bhakti, or Krishna Bhakti. Yes, beautiful. Krishna consciousness. So should I try to summarize and then if you have any concluding? Oh, no, absolutely, absolutely. It's about 3 a.m. here. Yeah, thank so, you for sparing so much time. No, so, this is Bhakti Thakur Seva and, uh, you know, this is important. Yeah. So it is a very wide ranging discussion. Basically, we try to discuss about how Bhaktivinoda Thakur uh, politically positioned himself politically to maximize the outreach. We've also mm. le- somewhat discussed about culture, religion and other aspects, but primarily mm. it was we focus on the politics and uh, he started by 
I mentioned that you know the younger brother, older brother example, that mm. the British are like the younger brother, the uh, we are like the older brother. So let the younger brother manage the estate. So you have explained that there's a lot more going on, and uh, the we talked about how the British at that time received moral authority for or derived their own moral authority for ruling, and mm. say when they went to America, they just uh, because they were not used to diseases coming from elsewhere and apart from the genocides it just the original culture got removed entirely all of those natives went away but in india they were used to invaders coming in many ways so then here it was at time how initially the british had a little hands off attitude but uh, the british rule became solidified from 1757 to 1857 after the battle after the mm-hmm. sepoy mutiny and then they between that, between uh, battle of polachi and the but yeah and the revolt and so then at that time the independence movement so during bhaktinath thakur's prime the independence movement was was more in a nascent stage in its very nascent stage people are thinking yeah. but not really acting on it and so prabhupad so bhaktinath thakur directed the thoughts in a way in which um, uh there could be as you said existential problems being addressed and within that he discussed uh, about bhakti vinod thakur using his position as a prominent member of the bhagdar loka as a as a deputy magistrate magistrate to bring respectability to gaudiya vaishnavism and its That's and its true. message and also when he retired that itself also created a sensation and through that also when he started talking about i am dedicating myself to build a temple that also brought cultural value Uh, uh, to what he was doing and then a major theme of our discussion was is political disengagement a matter of principle not at all that was it was more of strategic political engagement to protect uh, protect the values of dharma and that's right even in the royal ministry when the kshatriyas were ruling at that time it was the kshatriyas their purpose was ethical rule so that the values of dharma like truthfulness and cleanliness and mercy these could be maintained and when we had more of renunciates of saintly teachers they also were engaging so rather than taking politics as only meaning occupying a position or mm. supporting a particular party it can also mm. mean shaping public policy in a way that is conducive for uh, society and for spirituality so chetan mahaprabhu chetan mahaprabhu did that through his his civil disobedience or non cooperation movement where he got the right to practice kirtan to to freely kirtan with new chand khan his presence and then mm-hmm. he also had rupesh sanatan goswami go to vrindavan so that they could strategically negotiate with the british rulers and the fact that we had uh, mughal rulers mughal rulers, rulers, sorry, mughal rulers and the fact that we had the sandstone temples indicates that they were like government authorized temples and it was the expertise of The, the so we we have to remember when the Mughals came in. Mughals came in, I think, you know, there, there there were a period between the Turkish and the Mughals where, you know, things were rough. Yeah. Right. When, and so at that when, cusp, when Rupa Goswami was there, I think it was by Rupa Goswami's time that the Mughals were established. See, Babur came way before. Then anyway, we could yeah. go into the dates. But basically, they basically interacted so that they could have, build those temples over there and. Stabilize the so what Radha Kund was basically a pond in which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had, had extracted rice field, there, but then that had to be established. So Bhakti, so our Acharyas did that over there, mm-hmm. and then we discussed about Bhakti Sanskar Thakur, Lalit Prasad. They all carried on the legacy in different ways, which is a different subject. But it's not a matter of principle. And mm-hmm. when we look at Shri Prabhupad and analyzing an Acharya Sras. acharya's action strategically is is also a part of our our tradition different devotees may do it in different ways so if you want to learn we can look at it from a transcendental perspective but you can also look at it from a practical sociological perspective to see how we can operate i and, mean yeah and yes let me complete this and as far as you know in today's world mm-hmm. it, politics is not like one untouchable field but in any area we want to enter into we need a competence we need insight from a material perspective and we need the character and the compassion from a spiritual perspective only then 
we will be a part of the solution otherwise we may well and be a part of a bigger problem and then the vaishnava hmm. ethics about politics or the vaishnava ethos about politics could be conveyed to namo brahmani devaya verse hmm. where the caliber of a society and how it is going to promote welfare in society can be seen by how it protects the members who contribute but are vulnerable and the cows and the brahmanas most vulnerable they are most, most vulnerable. vulnerable and they are also having they are actually significantly contributing also whether yeah. brahmanas significant and vulnerable it's yeah. like wearing a helmet when you ride a bike you know why would you wear a helmet why not braces <laughs> you know this is the most vulnerable part of the human body <laughs> okay beautifully put and then we also one point interesting point was that's so a politics if you consider different areas of human society there is religion deals with the finding meaning culture refers to the norms in which society operates and economics is the provision generation and provision of resources so mm. politics traditionally meant focusing or uh, it focuses primarily on the economic aspect and if you consider or authority authority to decide economic systems yeah the authority to decide how economic resources will be generated utilized divided and generated. what systems will operate yeah so the british in some part of their history had a less hands off less uh, less involved strategy with respect to how the economics would affect the culture and the religion later on they became more involved and they had a divide and pol- divide and rule so our focus is when we are trying to practice bhakti and share bhakti is that we want to take not only get ourselves to practice bhakti but create a ethos by which take positions by which the bhakti message can reach a larger number of people and we can create situations where that can reach can happen and in that sense a devotee can actively responsibly competently engage with society mm. you're saying some things yeah no i just had one concluding realization if i may share that yeah, means that is i i read this in a book long time back that when the when the caterpillar turns into a butterfly there is a time when it remains in the cocoon and various parts of his body begins to disintegrate but within the caterpillar's body are these cells that usually remain asleep for the entire life of the caterpillar but as the transformation happens these cells connect with each other and the butterfly that eventually comes out of the cocoon happens because these cells connect with each other starts you know combining and creating the new body and i think that that is how bhaktivinoda thakur would have explained what he meant by vaishnavism if he were speaking to us today he looked at the universal dimension of bhakti he looked at what krishna wanted what chaitanya mahaprabhu wanted he said that the bhagavatam to us looked like a repository of bad ideas when we were in college but when i read it it blew my mind and he called mahaprabhu his eastern savior and the gene the mighty genius of nadia right and this is after he has completed all his education you know and he's quite established himself and this happens because he feels that he can and future people can connect with others around the world irrespective of their cultures so they can connect you know interculturally but on the universalist principles that are taught by sri chaitanya mahaprabhu and i was saying something a little few minutes back we're talking about sambandha abhidhaya and prayojana Mm-hmm. and if you think about it the teachings of krishna can be encapsulated in three words first is dharma the second is yoga and the third is rasa and these are the three universal things that kind of correspond with sambandha vidya and prayojan that bhaktivinoda thakur really wanted to be understood and accepted by leaders of society around the world irrespective of their cultures right so um that is the genius i would think he is the mighty genius of calcutta <laughs> because among his friends colleagues nobody were thinking like he was on a global level i don't know of many people who wrote to emerson emerson was looked up to whereas bhaktivinoda treated emerson as a colleague 
right? So while his peers were hero worshiping Emerson and Monier Williams and other people, Bhaktivinoda Thakur was saying, oh, these are intelligent people. They need to understand Mahaprabhu's mission, which is for the benefit of all forms of life on this planet, especially the most vulnerable. And to serve them, thinking of them as sparks of Sri Krishna. And remembering the Hare Krishna mantra, Hare Krishna, you know, which is like a love song. And to Jibe Daya Krishna Nama Sharbo Dharma Shar. Sharbo Dharma means all the various dharmas that you have around the world. If you look at the essence, you will see reciting the holy names with love and serving other living entities or living beings is the essence of all dharmas. That is, so I just wanted to conclude on that note. A beautiful meditation about how Bhaktivinoda Thakur actually, so his singular focus was on uh, revealing how Krishna Bhakti offered universal wisdom that could address the fundamental fundamental or the root problems of human society. And so we connect with Krishna internally. Yes. We contribute to connect with Krishna internally by chanting his holy names. And then we contribute to society externally by uh, through Jivadaya. Jivadaya is like... Not just chanting his holy names, gradually beginning to realize who Krishna is. That beginning to realize Krishna is not, first with his name, then with his qualities. Uh, Nama, Rupa, Guna, Lila. That's true. Uh -huh. Wow. So name is the entry point, but at some point when Namu, Rupa, Guna, Leela all come together, then you can witness Krishna within your heart. Um, and Krishna's own teachings uh, point to the fact that love is transcendental to time. Yeah. And so Krishna loves each and every one of his devotees, uh, you know, when they worship him with all, his, all their hearts and their intelligence. And how to worship it, you know, by, by practicing dharma all his devotees practice dharma he wouldn't krishna wouldn't hang out with anybody when they did not practice dharma example is or <laughs> the core of us mm -hmm. yoga he himself practiced yoga according to the 11th canto of the bhagavad but more important it was the, the rasa the prayojana uh, you know why what is the point of life and yogeshwar Prabhu and i were having a dialogue once on this and you know he's a very interesting character he's a he's a humanist and he's an author uh, writes popular literature and a Holocaust historian and his brother is Brian Green, the scientist no, I met, I, from he Columbia. He also comes regularly on this podcast, so we know him quite well. So, Prabhu, yeah. so you know, this dharma, actually this categorization of Sambandha Abhide Prayojan, this is something which is very important. We could discuss this more in the future. But oh, if, absolutely. Whenever you want. You, say something about, you can complete this point of dharma, artha and dharma and rasa and what are the three things? Sambandha dharma, Abhide. yoga and rasa. Okay. So yoga is the way of dharma is what are the foundational values that guide our life. Yoga right. is the process that we use to uh, to grow to grow or evolve or to connect with the ultimate reality. The process. And rasa is what we experience. Ex experience. The purpose. The purpose. Okay. Beautiful. So thank you very much for your time, Prabhu. It has been... Thank, thank you for your time and take care, please. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.